Good morning. It's good to see all of you uh, worshiping and celebrating our divine liturgy. Congratulations to, to Marcia and Richard on uh, their chrismation to our church today. Um, welcome. I'm glad that you're all here. You're celebrating our divine liturgy. Really, I hope and pray that you're here because we are worshiping and we are praying as a family and really celebrating everything that God gives each and every one of us on a day-to-day -day basis. We do this every single Sunday when I look into the camera to those of you that are uh, watching our services. Wherever you may be, you're, on, you're part of our online church family. We're grateful that you're part of our community. We're glad that you have found Saint of the Divine, your spiritual home. If you are downloading this week's message, can I just tell you that we are grateful that you're growing in your walk of faith. And if you and if all of you find these messages, that if you find them beneficial to your own walk of faith, chances are they will be helpful and beneficial to the people that are in your circle of influence and their walk of faith. So just do one word, share. Share these messages because we hope and pray that they can encourage and welcome uh, people into our church and also help them in their walk of faith. I also want to just give a quick note. If you happen to be uh, new to our church, or this is your first Sunday here, if you're just worshiping for the first time, um, we are grateful that you're here. And we invite you downstairs. We have an entire section of our, um, of our church hall. That's all to you. It's all about um, giving you the information about what our church is about and really the vision, the, the purpose, and what we're all about as a community. So I encourage you downstairs. I'd love to get the opportunity to meet you. So meet us at the guest information table. So a couple of weeks, last week we began a new sermon series that, to be honest with you, I was so pleased about just how well uh, the response was from it. We talked about a sermon on the power of prayer. And today I want to kind of continue that conversation by talking to you about having a prayer-first lifestyle. In every organization that you know, every nonprofit organization, every institution, they will all have a statement, a vision that everyone within that core organization is totally aware of. They call that in the field of marketing a rally cry, that everyone in that organization knows that rally cry. In the Orthodox Church, we have a rally cry, one of many. But I told you last week that that rally cry is two words. It's pray first. That we as a church, no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing as a church, we will first pray. Before we put a shovel in the ground, we pray first. Before we do anything as a community, we just simply pray first. And Christ tells us throughout the entire Bible that one of the signs of a successful church is not how much money they raise. It's are they a pray first church. And if that's the case that Christ tells us as a church, how important is that for you in your everyday life? But for many of us, friends, we can come to church on a Sunday morning. We can come to this place and worship. We can come to this place on a Sunday morning and check the box. I came to church on a Sunday morning. We can come to this place and say, God, I need you. And for many of us, friends, this place becomes the only place that I'm spending time with God. To make matters worse, many of us, as we journey in our life, have these types of prayers. Maybe you can relate to some of these. Some of them are the 9-11 prayers. Those are the prayers that you're never really talking to God until something major happens in your life. You're just kind of coasting, everything's going good in your life, and then, oh my, I've got a problem, I need to pray. That's a 9-11 prayer. Maybe some of you can relate to that. Or maybe for some of you, you have that conditional prayer. God, I'll do this, provided that you do that. I'll promise I'll come to church every Sunday, but just please make sure that this gets resolved. For some of you, you have that rehearsed prayer. That's that prayer where you just simply are just saying a prayer out of rehearsal. No real meaning behind it. You know it cognitively, but you're not connected emotionally. And my favorite is the, the fire prayer, the, the fire house prayer, the prayer in which you're at, everything in your house is burning up, and you haven't been praying, you've been trying to solve the problem all on your own, and eventually when the house is totally on fire, you're like, God, now I need you. And for many of us, God becomes an afterthought. It's after everything else hasn't worked, then I'll go and pray to you. But can I give you just a word of encouragement? I don't want what I'm going to say to you to simply go to your ears. I want it to go through your ears and to your heart. 
God doesn't want to be your Sunday God, but he does want to be your everyday God. God wants to speak loudly in your life if you just will simply make him part of your everyday life. He doesn't want to be an afterthought in your life. No, 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 no. But he does want to be your first thought in your life. In the book of John, it's quite interesting, this imagery that Christ uses for all of us. He, he's sitting with his disciples, and they're all just enamored by him, and they're just watching him. And he says to them this, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So, and then he uses this one word, remain in me. You know what the word remain means? It means to stay where he has asked you or stay where you were called to be. For many of us in that, in that mindset, in that imagery, you know that a branch that's cut off from the vine doesn't survive. It eventually withers and dies, right? What God is saying is that you can do things all on your own, but over time, if you're not connected to me, it will not work out. So if you want, for example, your marriage needs to get better today, listen to me. Christ would be telling you, remain in me. You want to raise your children better? Jesus would be looking at your eyes and telling you, remain in me. You want your business to get better than it is right now? Jesus would look at you and say, don't worship the money, but remain in me. God is telling every one of us, me and you alike, to remain in him. What would it look like in your life if you had him remaining in you and you remained in him? So Father Nick, tell us how to make that practical. How do we remain in him? How do we have God, not just a Sunday God, but an everyday God? Well, if you looked in your worship guide this morning, I kind of give you some hints on how to go about doing it. I call them the, the three Ps, and if you took out your worship guide, you should have gotten it when you came in this morning. And every Sunday when you come in in the morning, make sure that the, uh, you get one of these. They're really just helpful uh, sermon opportunities for you to kind of just follow along and take notes if it's beneficial. But I gave you what, are called, what I'm calling the three Ps, that if you want to live a life where God is first in your life, that you're a pray-first lifestyle, then these three Ps are powerful and pertinent in your life. So here's number one. If you want to live a prayer first life, priority in prayer. That prayer has to be a priority in your life. Can I just give you a little message on a side note about this? You can always tell how important something is to someone, I've told you all this before, by the priority they place on it. So in a marriage, if you've been having problems in your marriage, if you keep telling that person to stop, stop, yet they continue to have the same exact pattern, then it's not a priority in their life. You always know the importance of something in someone's life by the priority they are placing on it. In the same way as your own prayer life, what you do first in your day will dictate the course of your day. King David says, early in the morning, I wake up and I give praise to God. He understood that principle that the first matters. The first has the opportunity to bless the rest. Let me give you even more practical examples. If you look at your calendar at home, if you looked at a calendar on the wall, Sunday is always at the very first or the far left of that calendar. Look at it today. Why is that? In the Bible, in the Old Testament, Saturday, or the Sabbath, is supposed to be honored as the day of the Lord. Why do they switch from Saturday, the, one of the commandments that says to honor the Sabbath in the Old Testament, and then switch in the New Testament to Sunday? It's never once mentioned in the Bible. What was the purpose in shifting from Saturday to Sunday? Two reasons. One is Sunday. Sunday, as you all know, is the day that Christ rose from the dead. It is the Easter. It is the Pascha Sunday. Christ rose on a day like Sunday. But also is this. Sunday is the first day of the week, not Monday. And the church was showing us from the very beginning, Sunday is the first day of the week. And where are you at on a Sunday morning? You're right here in church, dictating and showing it's the first part 
of your everyday life. And in the same way as your day, when you wake up in the morning before you do anything, Lord, good morning. I want to live today for you. That if this is the last day I have on this earth, I want to live it for you. You are my priority. Second P, you got to have a place of prayer. You got to have a place that you go and pray. Well, Father Nick, I come to church. Yes, so did Jesus. But Jesus had a church outside of the church. Many theologians talk, call this the Garden of Gethsemane. And many of you that have been to Jerusalem with us last year on our pilgrimage, and we're going again next year, so hopefully all of you can come with us next year. But Jesus would withdraw to that place of the Garden of Gethsemane. If you ever go to Jerusalem, it's quite interesting, but the Garden of Gethsemane is not some random location that someone just wanted to till the ground and put a whole bunch of olive trees there. The Garden of Gethsemane is at the bottom of the Mount of Olives. You know what the view that you see on almost every single postcard of the city of Jerusalem is taken from? The, that, on that little that postcard is that of the Garden of Gethsemane. And could it be that Jesus was in his place looking at his city, looking at Jerusalem and saying, Lord, watch over these people. I'm going to die for these people. Guide these people. He had a place that he would pray. Where is your place? Is it your little prayer corner at your house? Maybe it's a place where you're on your, when you're walking at night. You need to have a place outside of this place to pray every single day. Third P, and that is you got to have a plan. You got to have a plan for prayer. I told you this last week, but when the disciples were watching Jesus, all of the disciples were Jewish people. They already knew how to pray, at least in their own understanding. But Jesus, those disciples look over at Jesus and they say to him, Lord, an amazing statement. Lord, teach us how you pray. How are you praying? I haven't seen anything like that before. We want to pray the way you're praying. And he gives them seven statements on how to pray. We call that the Lord's Prayer. And on the back of that worship guide that I gave you, that insert, are just some prayers that I pray. You don't have to pray these prayers, but they're just a plan for you that when you're during your day, I remember Father Nick giving us those prayers. I'm just going to simply pray those prayers in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. I'm not going to depend on myself to determine those prayers on my own. I'm going to simply connect to God. I have a plan of prayer. I'll leave you with this. This saint of our church is named St. John Chrysostom. The liturgy that we're doing right now, he put together. He brought that liturgy together. And for many of you, you, you might know, think that St. John actually wrote the entire divine liturgy. That's not true. St. John Chrysostom gathered Bible verse at a Bible verse and compiled it into that divine liturgy. I oftentimes tell our people that are coming into our church, they're like, Father Nick, these are new people that are coming in. They'll say, Father Nick, are you a Bible-based church? And I tell them, everything about this church is a Bible-based church. That even our liturgy is a Bible-based liturgy. And there's one statement that I'm going to say in a few minutes over all of you. It says this, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, listen, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. And many of you just kind of sit there and you bow. But can I just tell you something? That prayer is not from St. John. It's St. Paul's last statement to a people in a city of Greece called Corinth. He tells them that prayer. It's a benediction type of a prayer. And how you pray, listen to me, how you view God will shape how you pray to God. So let me just share with you a little bit about this amazing grace of God. You know what the word grace means? It's a free gift. You can't earn it. That Jesus Christ, when it says the grace of Jesus Christ, what it means is that Jesus Christ says to you and to me, I'm going to die for them. I'm not waiting for them to be good. I'm not going to slap them on their wrist to behave. No, I'm going to come and I'm going to die for every one of them. That Christ didn't just carry a nice necklace around his neck. He carried the cross on his back. He died so that you and I could live. That's a free gift. You can't earn it. 
the love of God the Father, that we worship a Father that maybe some of you did not experience in your own childhood, that maybe your dad was that someone that you could go to in love, or that for that matter showed you love. But the love that God has, it says that I love you so much that I'm sending not one of my sons, but my only son to come to, for these people, for my people. That I love them so much that I'm going to come and I'm going to send my only son and I'm going to watch his body be ravaged. And I'm going to hear him in the Garden of Gethsemane where he prays and says, take this cup from me. I'm going to hear him crying out and I'm going to send him because I love you and me so much. And then it says the last one, the communion of the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit? Many of us get the Father, the Son, but we struggle with the Holy Spirit. The word parakletos, the, word, the phrase, the prefix, para, means this, to stand alongside. It's to stand next to. The Holy Spirit is the person, the Godhead, that's standing next to you now and who never leaves you. That's why we prayed over Marcia and Richard that the grace of the Holy Spirit be upon them, that this is Holy Spirit is with them. So when you leave this church, you're not leaving alone. You're not walking to your car and putting on the alarm on your own, that the Holy Spirit is right next to you. And that when you feel that you're about ready to make a mistake and you hear that little, mm, not that, don't do that. Or when you're about ready to say something that you know you shouldn't say, mm, that little warning sign, that is the God of the Holy Spirit that's right next to you telling you, no, no. See, we worship a God that loves us so much, that doesn't want to leave us. And my prayer for all of you is this, that you would have prayer as your priority, that you find a place to pray, find your Gethsemane, and that you would have a plan on how you pray. Because God doesn't want to be your afterthought. He wants to be your first thought. He wants to talk to you today, but he wants you to make him part of your every day. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the amazing love that God had for all of us and the communion of the Holy Spirit who's right next to us be with all of you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.